so thanks for inviting me here. Um, I'm a physiotherapist and I'm working in Trinity College in Dublin. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll start by saying um, the title of my presentation refers to laboratory study, but for a physio, laboratory is much more like a small gym as seen here on your right. So it's, it's maybe not quite what you had in mind. Um, similar to the gym in Casey House or a physio department, but um, the fact that it's in a clinical research facility allows us to take quantitative measurements of the outcome measures we're interested in, which is a great strength of, uh, of the research, um, giving us more detail maybe than what we could have in a community setting. And I know there's been a lot of talk today about translating things into community, and I'll talk about the advantages and indeed disadvantages of conducting this type of research. Um, so the other thing it allows is during our exercise interventions to closely monitor patients, so monitoring heart rate, etc. So um, that's our lab, and that's the building it's um, located in, and that's where the studies I'm going to talk about today took place. And so the first one was published last year in um, AIDS and Behaviour, and we looked at the association between metabolic health and physical activity in men living with HIV. So we know that chronic cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome, etc., are now among the leading causes of death and disability um, <coughs> in those living with HIV, and that indeed exercise is one of the main treatment tools for this. But there hasn't been a lot of detailed investigations into these associations, especially with physical activity and exercise and fitness, etc., measured objectively. So we went ahead and looked at this. Um, these are the patient characteristics, and uh, we had 20 HIV negative, 20 HIV positive, and by study design, both groups were quite similar. So similar height, weight, BMI, pack years, alcohol consumption, etc. Um, and then physical activity levels, uh, there were differences. So we found that those living with HIV were occurring more physical activity and meeting physical activity guidelines, uh, whereas the HIV negative group were not. So this was, came as a surprise to us since the, most of the literature would say otherwise. Um, so because of the detailed analysis we could conduct with our outcome measures, we could look at the pattern of physical activity and it was discovered that those with HIV were occurring more bouts as well as longer bouts of physical activity. But one thing I will point out is the sedentary behaviour which in both groups was quite significant and a cause for concern. So although physical activity guidelines were being met, there was still a lot of sedentary behaviour in both groups. And that's an independent risk factor for several chronic diseases, including cancer to metabolic syndrome, um, cardiovascular disease. So that's something we may look into in the future. In terms of the blood pressure and venous blood results, four people in each group had the metabolic syndrome. So the profile was very similar again between both groups and indeed similar to our um, national average. So that again came as a surprise. So this is a fairly high functioning healthy group of people with HIV that we're looking at. Um, correlation analysis, this was a cross-sectional study. Correlation analysis revealed no significant relationship between indices of metabolic health and physical activity among the HIV negative group. However, in those living with HIV, there were uh, significant inverse relationships between physical activity at a moderate to vigorous intensity and uh, triglycerides as well as insulin resistance. So basically those who were achieving more physical activity had a better metabolic profile and that needed to be of a moderate to vigorous intensity, which we would expect to, to have change, whereas those, those uh, correlations did not exist in the HIV negative group. Uh, but how, perhaps more interestingly was the significant interaction between the metabolic syndrome and the presence of HIV. And if you, if you look here at the, the bottom dot, so these were the people who had a dual diagnosis of both the metabolic syndrome and HIV, and they were the least active of, um, of the four groups, um, although arguably they could have benefited the most. So it raises the question of whether those with dual diagnoses or indeed multiple diagnoses should be targeted for interventions where there's limited resources um, or provided with additional supports to achieve their physical activity goals because they are the group that are not achieving them. <coughs> 
So why were there relatively high levels of physical activity? It could have been a bit of selection bias. This, this was a study looking at physical activity, so perhaps those interested in physical activity were more likely to take part. Um, but that then would also have been true of the control group. Um, the, the other possible reasons is that there are hospital-wide and nationwide initiatives to promote physical activity, to promote healthy lifestyle behaviour change, and perhaps we're seeing these work. Um, there is a great effort in the clinic to keep people engaged with their care and into health care. So perhaps we're seeing the fruition of this in that people are starting to become more physically active. Um, the prevalence of the metabolic syndrome was similar to that of the Irish population, so that was a surprise considering the effects of antiretroviral therapy and we would expect a higher incidence of the metabolic syndrome in this cohort. And although causality cannot be assumed because this was a cross-sectional study, it's physiologically plausible that the increased physical activity being undertaken by those with HIV had a positive effect on their metabolic health. So um, that is <laughs> something we like to emphasise. <laughs> So I'll go on to my second study. Um, in this, we looked at people who are self-reporting as not being physically active. So this was a group of people living with HIV who self-reported as not engaging in 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week. And that group were invited to take part in a 16-week um, aerobic exercise program. And this time, our main outcome, what we were looking at, was cognitive function. Uh, why? Because as we've been told earlier by Francisco, uh, it's a big problem. Um, there's no effective treatment. Exercise could help. It has been shown in other populations to either prevent the progression of or indeed improve function in, in some cohorts. So we decided to look at this. Um, again, it took place in our gym and uh, we measured physical activity using an accelerometer here, which is a small device placed on the hip. And then cardiorespiratory fitness was measured using gas analysis on a treadmill and using an incremental exercise test um, up to 85% of predicted maximum um, tolerance. So a very gold standard as best as we could uh, given our, our limitations, measurements of what we're looking at at the people's fitness and at their activity level. Then cognitive function was measured using the, the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and the trail making test, trail A and trail B. Um, and then we added on sleep quality using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index just to see was it having any effect. Um, also because there was another model of these accelerometers that measure sleep and we wanted to know if there was any reason to go by them. So <laughs> we were looking at sleep. Um, so baseline correlation analysis, so this was before any intervention took place. Those who were taking more physical activity did score better on a cognitive test, so that was promising. Um, also, those who were fitter scored better on a cognitive test. The line goes down the way this time because the outcome measure is seconds to completion, and if you complete it quicker, it's better, so a lower score is better in this one. Uh, so that was very promising at baseline that we were seeing people who were more active, who were accruing more physical activity, and who were fitter were achieving better results in these tests. Um, uh, then results, adherence was a bit of an issue. Uh, I think Professor Bergen referred to the fact that this was a difficult study. And there's a few reasons for that. Some were our fault, some were completely out of our control. One of them was a flu outbreak, which uh, severely discouraged people from entering the hospital where this took place. And that goes back to the disadvantages of conducting such uh, exercise in a hospital. Um, people were reluctant to attend the hospital more times than they needed. Um, so again, a disadvantage of, of laboratory-based exercise. Um, and then other reasons, uh, well, I'll go on to our results. There was no significant difference between the groups after the exercise intervention. So 16 weeks of aerobic exercise that was two times a week supervised and once unsupervised with a 60% adherence rate didn't change cognitive function. However, it didn't change aerobic fitness either. So we would expect there only to have been a change in cognitive function if we had managed to increase fitness, and we didn't do that. Why did that happen? Well, people self-reported as, as engaging in less than 150 minutes of exercise per week, but actually when we measured their baseline exercise, they were exceeding that. Um, also, these people didn't have any detectable cognitive, function at base, cognitive dysfunction at baseline. 
So the MOCA and the Trails A and Trails B test were coming out as normal in, um, at baseline. So perhaps were we to repeat the study, we would target people who have either more progressed uh, hand or else use more sensitive measures. Uh, what we did find, so it was good that we put the sleep quality index outcome measure in there, was that daytime dysfunction, which is a subsection of the Pittsburgh sleep quality index, <coughs> did improve. So there were improvements, um, but ultimately no difference between the control and the intervention group in cognitive function for possibly the, the reasons I've stated. So what have we learned? Adherence, always an issue in exercise interventions, not necessarily unique to this group. Um, but I think the big question is, you know, what can we do to improve this? And a lot of people here have been talking about, well, you know, what can we do? And I think we really need to remain flexible as clinicians and as service providers. And um, I often tell my students when they ask, well, what is the solution to? How can I encourage my patient to? Or how can we fix that it's all the 1%? So you, there is a need to provide hospital-based exercise for those with complex clinical needs who require the supervision. There is also a need to provide perhaps just one session of motivational interviewing one-to-one, -one, take the physio out of the lab, put them in, a, in an armchair, um, and that might be the 1% that works for somebody else. The other 1% might be a community-based exercise program. Um, one of the other disadvantages we had at this program is that people didn't enjoy necessarily that the exercise class was a HIV exercise class and they would have preferred to have been mixed in a mixed group, whereas in other cohorts, they want to be in a specific group. So we need to do as much of the above as we can and as our, our limited resources allow. But one thing I think we can all agree on is the clear benefits of exercise and that with an aging population, this is only becoming more relevant. So we need to keep going. Thank you, and my, my email is there.